Good morning. It is nine o'clock Central Standard Time uh, here in Seagullville, Texas. We want to welcome you to the Dallas STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. I want to say a special welcome to Fred Florence uh, Young Men's Leadership Academy. Teachers, if you're watching, you haven't signed up, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash CEC register and sign up. This is just for our attendance records only. Thank you. Uh, the program this morning will be uh, factors affecting Earth systems. During this virtual field trip, students will predict and describe how catastrophic events impact ecosystems, analyze the effects of weathering, erosion, and deposition on the environmental environment in eco regions of Texas and investigate the effects of human activity on groundwater and surface water in a watershed. Mrs. Ramirez will tell you about floods and hurricanes. Mr. Monroe will discuss tornadoes. Ms. Nash, weathering, erosion, and deposition. And Ms. Fuller will tell you about groundwater and surface water. Uh, you cannot ask us a verbal question, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC space question space answer and send in your questions and we'll do our uh, very best to answer them. Uh, and that is, uh, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Ms. Ramirez is going to tell you about floods and hurricanes. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez and we're going to be learning about floods and hurricanes today and how they impact ecosystems. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys and we'll start our presentation. I do have a couple of essential questions for you guys. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is what is a hurricane? And the second is how do floods and or hurricanes impact ecosystems? And you should be able to give two examples. So keep those questions in mind as we go through the presentation today. So the video on your left is actually a video from uh, White Rock Lake in Dallas. And they that area experienced uh, a lot of flooding a few years ago. And so you can see how that water was just spilling over the spillway and how it flooded people's yards. Um, in some of the roadways and park areas. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. Um, so in our next slide, we're gonna start off first with hurricanes and we're gonna tie that into floods in just a second. Uh, so hurricane is just a tropical cyclone with winds of 74 miles per hour or greater that is usually accompanied by rain, thunder, lightning, and flooding. And uh, the hurricane uh, force is measured on the Saffir Simpson a uh, wind scale and it's based on a category of one to a category of five, five being the max with the uh, most damaging sustained winds. And we know looking from these infographics uh, that hurricanes form over warm ocean and uh, that warm air rises causing an area of low pressure below. And strong winds of a hurricane can break and uproot trees and cause severe flooding and damage. Uh, to not only trees and vegetation, but also to people's housing structures and buildings as well. And ecosystems can take decades to recover from damage uh, caused by hurricanes, especially those higher category hurricanes. And so in our next slide, we're going to take a look at some images from Hurricane Katrina. So we have what's called ecological succession. And succession is just an ecological change. So it's the slow development, or sometimes it can be a fast, a fast disturbance that causes this change. And it's the replacement of an ecosystem by another ecological community. So it's usually due to a natural uh, disaster or disturbance. Sometimes it can also be uh, due to man-made or man-prone uh, causes. So for example, we're talking about hurricanes and how hurricanes can lead to succession or a change in an ecosystem. So hurricanes can actually cause what's called secondary succession. And that's just is when an area has been disturbed, but soil is still intact. So for example, trees and grasses might be uprooted, uh, but the soil is still there. So here we have uh, the Chandelier Islands. Um, this is in 2001 versus 2005. So it's a before and after. So we know that Katrina hit in August of 2005 and it actually, that hurricane stripped away over 85% of those chandelier islands. So look at 
how much of a difference there is before and after and think about what do you think happened to those plant and animal communities that lived on that island and how did this hurricane impact those uh, living organisms so obviously a lot of the animals if they were terrestrial animals and could not swim uh, they probably perished in the flooding um, a lot of the plants, if they are not adapted to being submerged in water, they probably died as well. Um, so hurricanes can have devastating, devastating ecological impacts. In this other image, um, you can see how dunes have been destroyed because of the hurricanes. And this is also from Louisiana. Um, so we have, it was caused by a category three storm. It had 125 mile per hour winds, storm surges of averaging 10 feet high, some of them as high as 20 feet south of New Orleans. Um, so devastating impacts of those hurricanes. So the top image is from 2001. It's before Hurricane Lily in 2002. Now compare it to this 2004 image and this was after Hurricane Ivan in 2004. So notice some differences between those pictures. And then finally compare it to 2005 after Hurricane Katrina. So we're noticing um, that a lot of the vegetation is being washed away. A lot of the sediment is being eroded as well. So again, think about how those plants and animals are being impacted by these hurricanes, but also think about the people as well. Notice some of these houses and what it must be like for them to be living in that, uh, that area. And then here we are. Uh, this is just an example of that scale for our hurricanes with some of the average wind speeds and the storm surges as well. Now tying into hurricanes, I know in Dallas we really don't experience uh, those massive catastrophic impacts of hurricanes, but we can still experience flooding here in Dallas. And we know that flooding is just an overflow of water that submerges land that is typically or usually dry. And it can be caused by hurricanes or here in Dallas, if we have prolonged periods of rain or heavy rain with lots of runoff, and that can often create flash floods. So if you hear on the TV or the radio when they have a flash flood warning, um, that's what they're talking about. And we know that floods, just like hurricanes, can also impact ecosystems. So obviously plants that are not adapted to being submerged in the water, they're gonna die. And then also animals that aren't able to swim if they're typically terrestrial, uh, they may also perish in these floods. So here's just a little infographic that kind of explains succession. So we have our secondary succession where we have a nice grassy field. Uh, then all of a sudden we have heavy rains and there's a flood. Uh, the flood takes away a lot of that vegetation and the vegetation dies. Again, after the flood waters kind of recede, what's left since the plants died is just the soil. And so eventually over time that grasses and other plants will be able to come back and grow again. And who knows, the whole process might start all over again if there's another flood. Uh, so floods do impact ecosystems. And then here's a little example here at the Environmental Center. It's not really flooding, but we have what's called um, uh, ephemeral ponds. So we have a back pond that's kind of sometimes there and sometimes not there. So some months that pond will be full of water and then some months it'll be totally dry and you can walk right through it. Uh, but because that pond is constantly changing from dry to full, the plants and animals that live in that area are constantly changing. So because we've had so much rain lately, we're actually seeing and hearing a lot more uh, things like frogs and we're seeing more aquatic organisms like our red-eared sliders. So it is interesting to see how that pond changes and how it's also impacting the plants and animals that we're seeing. So I'm gonna show you guys the video. So there's the pond, there's actually some um, egrets and then hopefully you can hear those frogs. Now, fortunately, those plants are not really adapted for living underwater, so they'll probably eventually um, die, and that's because they become waterlogged. Uh, so plants need air too, and when the soil is so saturated, they're not able to get that. And then also, I'm going to pause it really quickly here. This is something I learned. When I went out there, I saw all these roly polies. Well, first I just saw a few of them, but then as I started looking, I saw like hundreds of roly polies. And I think they were stranded on the blades of grass. And so that posed a question to me is, why are all these roly polies on the grass? 
Um, and that is because roly polies, they cannot swim and they cannot survive submerged in water. So I felt so bad for those roly polies um, because they were kind of like hanging on to dear life on those uh, strands of grass because everything underneath them was submerged in water. Um, so I try to rescue as many as I can. Um, I didn't get all of them obviously, but I did, I did get those few and moved them to another location. But it is interesting to think how flooding uh, might impact not only those animals that we typically think of, but also the little tiny insects. Um, those are, that was the leopard frog you saw earlier and the red-eared slider. They are uh, aquatic, so typically we'll see them more often when we have water. Now, sometimes we can get so much rain that that back pond that you saw earlier will actually spill over into that front pond. And, and then one time we had so much rain and runoff that both those ponds kind of merged together and created this huge pond uh, that made its way up to that patio that you saw. Now, eventually, um, it normally always does this, eventually that the pond will start to evaporate and dry up because we have periods of no rain. And then eventually at some point, we'll start to have our plants and vegetation and brushes start to grow back again. So it is interesting to study and see how our own ecosystem out here is constantly changing. And so in our next little thing, um, I have an at-home experiment for you guys. See if you can create a model of an ecosystem. Uh, so you can see an example here, you just need a like, a like a flat box. You can put some soil in it and maybe decorate it with some plastic toys and trees. Um, pour water over the model to simulate a flood and think about how does that simulation affect your model. You can also research flood safety because again, we do experience flash floods here in the DFW area. And then some other questions for you guys might be, what is the role of vegetation and erosion uh, caused by floods? And then also, are there any flood resistant plants or crops? Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and stay, uh, stop our screen share and we're gonna give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. And the question is, uh, does a hurricane or flood cause the most damage? And uh, it says around the world, about 10,000 people die each year in hurricanes and tropical storms. While hurricanes have intense winds, waves, and even tornadoes, floodwaters are a very most dangerous aspect. And now, Mr. Monroe is going to tell you about tornadoes. Oh. Good morning, students. Can any, can you guys hear me? We can hear and see you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation, uh, if you'll bear with me. Can everybody see that? I, it kind of jumped on me a little bit. We cannot see your slides. Okay, let me go back. It did a job on me this morning, golly. Now everyone can see me, right? Good morning. We, we can see you. But yes, Mr. You Monroe, right. we can hear you and see you. Okay, well, I've, I've lost my PowerPoint. But listen, students, good morning. My name is Mr. Monroe, and I'm going to be going over some information, some data concerning the strongest storm in the world. Now, of course, hurricanes basically are the largest and tornadoes are the strongest simply because of the velocity that the wind occurs in that vortex that we call a tornado. And it's quite devastating whenever we have a tornado. 
Now, I'm going to go back and try to share my screen with you so that I can give you some data. And while we're going through the presentation, I really want you to think about what I'm trying to get over to you because your teacher may be, a, may be asking you a question about how tornadoes form and what impact do tornadoes have on the environment. And indeed, they are a devastating storm once they reach a so, certain, uh, certain scale. So let me see if I can get back to my PowerPoint. And it's gone. Yeah, I got it. Take me a little while here. Okay, we're talking about storms. And when we talk about a storm, we are actually talking about thunderstorms. We're talking about the tornado. And there usually has to be uh, a sudden change in air pressure. which causes a rapid air movement. Conditions that bring one kind of storm in one area often cause other kinds of storms in the same area. Major thunderstorms create tornadoes. And of course, Ms. Ramirez has already talked about and taught you a little bit about hurricanes. Now, in this image here, we see that we have a cumulonimbus cloud, which is involving a developing cell with warm, moist air in an updraft and cold, dry air in a downshift. In that thunderstorm, there is heavy rain and lightning. The National Weather Service always issues conditions that are favorable for a thunderstorm whenever those conditions exist, and we call that a watch. And that watch could be lasting as long as multiple hours. When a severe thunderstorm is approaching and we know for sure that it's coming, the local weather service, uh, service will issue a warning. That means a thunder, thunderstorm is been spotted in the area by Doppler radar. And that usually that warning can last for somewhere around an hour. Now, I'm gonna skip through the lightning part, but to be safe, it's best to be inside. Now, when we talk about tornadoes, we are talking about a rapidly swirling funnel-shaped cloud that reaches down from the, a cloud to touch the Earth's surface. It usually appears to be funnel-like, and it extends downward from a cumulonimbus cloud, sometimes referred to as a thunderstorm cloud. We have a spiral updraft, and inside the vortex, we have what we call the spiral inflow. The same system that produces thunderstorms can produce tornadoes. Late in the day, when the Earth's surface is very warm, convection, the flow of heat through a material causing hot parts to rise and cooler parts to sink, can get very strong. This can create tornadoes tornadoes or a vortex. In this image, we see two types. This one right here would be considered to be a rope tornado. And this one's a little thicker. Now, it is known that very large tornadoes can be as wide as a mile wide at the base. Now, when a tornado watch is given by the National Weather Service, that means conditions are favorable for a tornado to form. And that can last for hours, just like the uh, severe thunderstorm watch that is also issued. When a tornado warning is given, that means there is evidence that a tornado has formed. And at that point, you are supposed to be taking shelter. Tornado happenings. 
When the updraft in the convection cell is really strong, the air rushes in from all sides at high speeds. Air curves in a spin. This lowers the pressure even when the air rushes even faster and the pressure gets even lower and so on. It's almost like a skater who pulls her arms in close to her sides. The tornado spins faster and faster. As the tornado gets stronger, a funnel forms that can destroy anything in its path. The center of the tornado can reach speeds of 500 kilometers per hour, about 300 miles per hour or more. That's why they are considered to be the strongest uh, storm in the world. Where do tornadoes happen? Tornadoes happen where dry, cold air masses mix with warm, moist air masses. More tornadoes occur in the United States than in any other country, especially in an area known as Tornado Alley. And this is a famous tornado that happened in Grand Island, Nebraska. You can see that the houses there are totally devastated. And this happened in 1980. On June 3, 1980, a series of tornadoes devastated the city of Grand Island, Nebraska. Several tornadoes hit within a three hour period. The storm did massive damage and closed the city down for three days. Tornado Alley, in that area, about 800 tornadoes every year occur. Tornado safety, the safest place to take shelter in a storm shelter is in a storm shelter or in a basement of a well-built building. Now, students, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen with you. And, you know, tornadoes have a scale that they're measured by, and it's called the Fujita scale. And the original scale was uh, set up by a fellow by the name of Ted Fujita in 1971. In 2007, there was an enhanced scale put out and let me just read what that scale involves. An F1 tornado ranges airspeed or wind speed is somewhere below 73 miles per hour. That's an F0. An F1, 73 to 112 miles per hour. An F3, 158 to 206 miles per hour. Severe damage occurs at that point. An F4, 207 mile, uh, to 260 miles per hour, then that's devastating damage. And an F5 is 261 to 318 miles per hour, and that is incredible damage. Now, a tornado's impact on the natural environment or in our environment, once it hits uh, F2 on the scale, it can crack trees, break off trees, uh, even uproot some of the smaller trees, but when it gets up to that F4 and F5, and if it's uh, on the ground in an area of forest, it will devastate that forest by uprooting all the trees that are in its path. And that means that it's destroying the habitats of many animals that would use those trees as their habitat, even the trees that maybe even would provide nesting places and even food sources in those trees. So uh, they can be very devastating. And again, they are considered to be the strongest storm in the world. And I'm sorry that I took me a little long, but I did the best we could. So hopefully I've given you some information and I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman in case some of you have some questions, he can answer those for you. Yes, a student asked a question brought back some uh, uh, not too good memories. It said, have you ever been in a tornado? Yes, in 1996, my wife was teaching college at North Lake College and I picked her up from work. We were driving up 30 or down 35. By the time we got to Beltline, the tornado warnings and all came on. They said, take cover. So we got out and crawled up under a bridge over a creek down there, over a 10 mile creek down there. And that tornado passed directly over the top of us. Uh, it, my house was about a half a mile away. It tore the roof off my house, 
tore my fence down in the backyard and two square city blocks of Lancaster was destroyed completely. Not a house was left and about half of the square was destroyed. So that was quite an experience. Yes, I have been in a tornado. And now we're gonna let Miss Nash tell you about weathering, erosion and deposition. Hello, welcome to my classroom. So today we're talking about weathering, erosion, and deposition. And we're going to focus a little bit on Texas and con compare and contrast the different ecoregions and how they experience weathering, erosion, and deposition. So let's look at some pictures since we can't be in all those places at once, can we? Okay, so here and go back to the beginning. There we go. So weathering erosion and deposition. And you've probably studied this before, I know you have. So weathering is just breaking rock into smaller bits. Erosion is moving the little bits and deposition is dropping them. Okay, so breaking them, moving them and dropping them or depositing them. So there are two kinds of weathering, mechanical or physical weathering and chemical weathering. And both occur all around us. So mechanical weathering is maybe the one we think of most. And that can be human activity like buildings and, and our changing use of the, of the, if we cut down all the trees and the roots don't ever hold the soil, that can increase erosion. Um, when we build a road cut like that, we break up all the rock, it washes away, we create more um, slope. Um, we've also got freezing and thawing, not so much here in Texas, but recently some. Also heat will cause things to expand and, and break, contract as they cool. Roots of trees can go in through rocks that are really strong. If you have a sidewalk in your neighborhood, you might see where tree roots have uprooted the sidewalk. They're really strong as they grow. And then there's chemical weathering. So chemical weathering can occur from oxidation, like this red rusty rock up here, and iron, in it, and it's rusting, and that will weaken the, the structure of the rock, and it will erode away. Also, at rainwater is slightly acid, or from pollution can be more acid, and it can also have um, weathering effects on rock. Those are two kinds of weathering. Now. We have many ecoregions in Texas. We're not going to focus on all the tiny ones, but we're going to concentrate on the main ones. Okay. Um, being the panhandle up here in the north, very, very flat. Panhandle region, very, very flat. Lots of, of agriculture based on irrigation. Um, lots of um, cattle um, feedlots and cotton farming up there. Out here in West Texas, very desert, very, very dry, but also mountains. Okay, the Big Bend, Guadalupe. Okay, so mountainous and very, very dry. And we've got the Gulf Coast flat, okay, and more water coming in. We got the hill country, higher, um, more elevation, fairly dry, but steep canyons. And then where we are in East Texas, where it's flat, pretty flat and more rain, more water. And here in North Central Texas, pretty flat, moderate rain, lots of people where we are. So erosion by Widner, more of a moves weather drop. So we got these famous canyons, the Grand Canyon, Bryce Canyon, more Grand Canyon, and these slot canyons in Utah. So you can see how the, the water has cut down through these canyons and washed the rock away. Um, West Texas, okay, out here, has these mountainous areas. And again, if there's water around, it can wash that rock and dirt away. Also agriculture, humans, okay, in the um, panhandle, was affected years and years ago by the dust bowl, so overgrazing, bad farming practices and the vegetation is all gone, wind, high winds up there, it's always flat. Okay, part of Tornado Alley, like Mr. Monroe was showing you. And then all that dirt can blow away, wind erosion. 
So here's some of our famous canyons. Okay, one in West Texas and one in Big Bend. So up in the Panhandle, we have the Santa Elena, we have the Palo Duro Lake. So you see water down the bottom here. So you're cutting down through that, that flat. It's pretty flat up on top, but that water has cut it down. This is the Palo Duro Canyon State Park. And then, of course, in Big Bend, we have the Santa Elena Canyon in the Big Bend. Again, look how steep those sides are. And then look how muddy that water is, carrying lots and lots of, of that eroded material, okay, carrying it out towards the Gulf of Mexico. It's a great place to go and do some hiking. Really amazing, both those places. So um, as they carry that water, that eroded material out, they deposit it and they can form a delta where the river meets the sea or the, or the Gulf of Mexico here as rivers bring sediment down. So here in north central Texas, we have a lot of rivers that look like this, is it flat? Right? So it's flat, the water's going really slowly and it's going to deposit. See how this is kind of being uh, cut off from the main flow and it will deposit in these what they call oxbow. Okay? Is it looks like what they used to put on the oxen when the oxen pulled carts. Mm -hmm. These oxbow rivers are typical of our part of, of Texas, and they go slowly and they deposit a lot of, of sediment. Okay. And then if they, they will change course and then leave this place behind. Okay. So you can see how it's just depositing lots and lots of material being washed down. This is my favorite. I put this in, but it's a very unique delta. We don't have this here, but it's for the in Africa, where the Okavanga River flows seasonally into the Kalahari Desert. Right? It just goes in the desert and then creates all this wonderful water and, and plants for the elephants and all the other animals, and then it dries up. Okay? And animals have to find their last little bit of water. So in Texas, we have our um, Gulf of Mexico, okay, where those rivers, all the rivers flow into that Gulf of Mexico. All the rivers in Texas flow into the Gulf of Mexico. And so we're bringing, bringing nutrients and also silting okay, for agriculture and other, other factors um, into those estuaries okay, where the fresh water meets the sea. And those are really productive natural environments. We've got our famous whooping crane that lives there eating a blue crab. And again, a really great place to go visit. So here's um, our East Texas over here. So water going slowly, moving very slowly, and of course depositing as that still falls out from gravity, it's going to deposit lots of sediment. And this is the Gulf Coast again, where the rivers are coming in. And here's our area, North Central Texas, again, pretty flat. So things don't move very quickly. And that gives the, the um, sediment a lot of time to fall out, to be deposited. Oops. There we go. Okay, so lots of things to, to learn about, to observe in your own environment, okay, right? If you go down to White Rock Lake after a rain, you can see a lot of stuff being deposited on the shore. It's not sediment, but it's trash. It's being eroded away from places farther upstream, okay? So you can go walk around the neighborhood, walk around the school and see where you can find weathering, like those tree roots pushing up the sidewalk where you can find mud being deposited at the creek side and all those interesting things to learn. So thank you. And if you have any questions, Dr. Gorman will be glad to answer. Thank you, Ms. Nash. Question is, how can you reduce soil erosion? Okay, then there's four ways. Maintain a healthy perennial plant cover. Perennial means a plant that comes back year after year. You do not have to replant it. The annual is one that you have to replant every year. So I always try to plant perennials so I'm done with them. Uh, you can mulch, spread a layer of mulch. 
uh, you can plant a cover crop such as winter rye uh, in yards and vegetable gardens. And I used to do this in my yard, but I felt kind of silly out in the middle of December mowing green grass when everybody else's grass was brown. So I have to admit, I haven't done that in the last couple of years. And you can place crushed stone, wood chips, or other similar materials in heavily used areas where vegetation is hard to establish and maintain. That way you can do your part about preventing soil erosion. Uh, thank you again, Ms. Nash. And now Ms. Fuller is going to tell us all about groundwater and surface water. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm on the north patio of the Environmental Education Center out here in Seagoville. And behind me, you can see our small pond. It's beyond this dead tree right here. And it is, uh, like Miss Ramirez pointed out, an ephemeral pond. Most of the time it has water, but sometimes during the deep summer, it actually uh, dries up completely. We're gonna talk about the differences between surface water, like the pond, and groundwater. So let me get my uh, PowerPoint started right here. And we're gonna look at all these different things. So groundwater and surface water and factors affecting our systems. So on your left, you see a lake and on your right, you see a windmill. Now we do have a windmill here at the Environmental Center. I tried to position my uh, camera so that you could see it but it's a gray day and the windmill is gray. So the camera actually will not pick it up, but it's a very, very important part of farming and ranching in that these windmills can pump water from deep in the ground, which is very crucial during parts of the year when there's very little rainfall, but the, the, the animals still expect to, to drink. Now let's look at a couple of essential questions. What are two ways we see surface water on earth? And number two, what do we call rock or sediment underground that is water bearing? So you've got a river over here on our left on the surface of the earth. And over on the right, we've got a diagram about water that's underground, groundwater. So surface water, there's surface water found, this is Water found on the surface, pretty self-explanatory. And there are three types, perennial, ephemeral, and man-made. Now, Mr. Uh, Dr. Gorman just made a reference to perennial plants. The word perennial means just, it's always there. The word ephemeral means that it's fleeting. It doesn't stay very long. Man-made, it means it's made by man. All of these terms are pretty self-explanatory. Surface water can include lodic or flowing water and lintic water, which is still. And sources include rain, melting snow, and springs. So let's first talk about lodic water. Lodic water is surface water that flows. And examples of lodic water include rivers, streams, creeks, bios, and streams. Now, I grew up on the Gulf Coast and there were bios behind our houses and the water fl uh, flowed through it. It didn't flow very fast, but it did flow through the bio and it was very rich environment for uh, aquatic organisms. Um, you're probably all familiar with rivers and perhaps uh, streams. A creek is just uh, another word for a stream. And then springs are uh, surface water that came from deep in the earth. So let's talk now about lintic water. Lintic water is water that is still, it doesn't flow. And examples of lintic water include lakes, ponds, sloughs, bogs, fins, and stock tanks. So uh, if you'll look at the uh, stock tank over on your left, uh, this is man-made. Uh, and uh, it, it's a collection of water for the uh, cattle to come and drink. And uh, very often these are ephemeral. If it gets real dry, they'll just dry up and the farmer will have to rely on his windmill to pump water to, to give water to his livestock. And now over there on the right, you see a picture of a pond like we have here behind me. And it's a, kind of like a tiny lake. 
It doesn't flow anywhere. Sometimes water flows into it and sometimes it's simply restocked by a rain. And there actually are some that are spring fed, uh, spring fed like uh, I think Barton Springs in Austin is probably the most famous one here in Texas. It's a small two acre lake that's fed by a spring underneath it. Now, as far as lakes are concerned, Texas only has one natural lake. That's Caddo Lake in East Texas. And I know that's a big surprise to a lot of people because we all know lots of lakes, but they're all man-made. And these lakes were built for flood control, for recreation, and water reservoirs for drinking and irrigation. So um, uh, different communities receive their uh, water th that uh, operates their communities uh, from different sources. Some communities rely on wells and that's tapping into uh, an aquifer or water that's stored deep in the earth. Some rely on rivers, some rely on wells like artesian wells, some rely on these man-made lakes. Now groundwater, like surface water, this tells you what it is. It's water found in the ground. Aquifers are water bearing layers beneath the earth uh, that are made of things like rock and sand and gravel. And these structures allow water to flow through them. Texas has nine major aquifers and 22 minor aquifers. And uh, we can extract water from from them for cities and for agriculture. If you look at the diagram below, you'll see that there are some aquifers that have what's called a confining bed. And that means a layer that's um, non-permeable. Uh, water can't go through it. In this particular case on this diagram, it's clay. And the clay causes the water to stay in the, the formation below. In this particular case, it's limestone probably a, a karst region where it's got large holes in it and the water can flow. Uh, the Edwards Aquifer in Texas is a good example of a limestone aquifer. All right. So these are the nine major aquifers of Texas. I believe that you're required to know them. The Pecos Valley, the Seymour, the Gulf Coast, the Carrizo Wilcox, the Hueco Mesilla Bolsons, and then we get to the Ogallala. The Ogallala serves eight states, not just Texas. It serves Wyoming and South Dakota. It serves Colorado, Nebraska, and uh, Kansas. It serves Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Texas. It is a huge, it's probably the largest aquifer in the United States of America. And unfortunately, we are, we are overusing it. We have overused it since the end of World War II and it's drawing down. The problem is it doesn't recharge easily. It's the water in it is fossil water. It's been there probably 10,000 years. And when we deplete the Ogallala, it'll take about 6,000 years for it to be recharged by rainfall. So we, this is one treasure we have that we have got to protect. Now the Edwards Trinity on, on the plateau in the middle of the state, the Al Edwards Balcones Fault Zone, and then the Trinity. So these are our nine major aquifers. The Edwards can recharge completely in three days uh, if we have extremely heavy rains because it's that large uh, karst region uh, that's limestone in the center of the state. Now here's a water challenge for you. Find out where your community gets its drinking water. Be sure and tell your teacher. If you live in uh, Dallas, I want you to know we do not drink out of the Trinity River. And here's another question. Do we have an aquifer or aquifers under Dallas? Is, is that where we get our drinking water? Well, that's for you to find out. So that's my challenge to you. I'm going to go ahead and get out of my uh, screen here. And if you have any questions about surface water or groundwater, Dr. Gorman will be more than happy to tell you about it. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. Beautiful pictures. Okay, the question is, is groundwater cleaner than surface water? Okay, groundwater quality. Through runoff, air fallout, and other sources, 
Surface water can contain significant amounts of contaminants such as chemical pollutants. Therefore, groundwater generally contains fewer contaminants than surface water and requires less treatment to make it pure enough for you to drink. Thank you. Now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, during this virtual field trip, students predicted and described how catastrophic events impact ecosystems, analyze the effects of weathering, erosion, and deposition on the environment in eco-regions of Texas, and investigated the effects of human activity on groundwater and surface water in a watershed. Uh, Mr. Maris talked about floods and hurricanes. Mr. Monroe told you about tornadoes. Ms. Nash, weathering, erosion, and deposition and Ms. Fuller discussed groundwater and surface water. Thank you. Teachers, how did we do? If you would, go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback, fill out a very short form and return it to us. We would appreciate it. You guys have a great rest of the day, but more importantly, have a great rest of your life. Thank you for joining us.